Well, good morning, church. I'll try that again. Good morning, church. <laughs> I'm glad uh, there wasn't, I guess, a, too much nodding off between the time we finished singing until, until now, but hopefully there was no, no nodding off or paying or f- being distracted during our singing. I know, I know there wasn't. It was a joy to... The only time, the only reason I actually like sitting in the front row, and I do not like sitting in the front row out of just personality, but the only time I enjoy it is Sunday mornings when I can hear the church gathered and the voices singing together. And not just as one voice, but all of the different voices. Because I know each of you, and I know where you are in life and what God is doing, and for you to worship the Lord in the midst of all things in your life is true worship. And so thank you for your encouragement. Again, I also want to thank you for your continued prayers. Uh, just for my foot and health, it's, this morning was the first, it was a milestone achievement this morning. It was the first day in two and a half weeks where I can actually lift my foot, my toes towards my, my shin for the first time. So it's a monument today. Somebody asked if you're feeling better. Um, you see this stool, we'll, we'll see how often I'm up and down. Uh, this morning, but I will do my best to serve us. And I'm grateful there's an element of this text that we're going to be in today, which is 1 Corinthians 3, so you can make your way there, where it talks about all of the teachers as we've been hearing about their jealousy and division. I'm just going to say this morning, because of the fogginess of my own brain, but also the medication, there's going to be about 15 other men that I have studied this week that are standing that you can't see behind me today, that I am grateful for that are going to serve us in a number of ways. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 23 is our text this morning. Last week, just as a, a brief reminder, we were admonished to build our lives on Christ. We were asked the question, what are you building your life on? And we were warned and admonished and encouraged from Paul in his letter here to the Corinthians What would happen if we built our lives on anything other than Christ? Yes, if you are ultimately saved in Christ, then you will be saved. But the things that you build for yourself, the things that you do not build with eternal value will be burned away. They will be all for naught. And this morning, verses 16 and 17 are a continuation and ultimately a final word on this building imagery that Paul has been using here in chapter 3. And then we come to verses 18 through 23, which really is the, the summary that, we've, that Paul is going to bring to this address that he started back in chapter 1, verse 10. He's been building to this point. He's been addressing specifics of division, of boasting, of wisdom, of hearts, of actions, of what you're building your life with. And here this morning, we come to the ultimate and final word on the matter of division in their church. I'm thankful. I know as a pastoral team, we are grateful to God that we are not a church in active division, that this is not a word necessary for us right now. I I thank God for his grace that's in our midst, that we are not divided as a church. So here's how we, we continue to take these words this morning. We take them as prescription for us. We take them as words that will serve us individually and corporately as a body. We take them and we heed them and we consider them and we be on guard with these words against division in our hearts. And the way that we do this is to be captivated by the vision that's before us in these verses from God's word. So read along with me as I read out loud, starting in verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. 
For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God. Spirit of God, I I pray that this morning your word would be open to us, that you would reveal and illuminate it to us. We are completely dependent on you for all things, and we are dependent upon you to do this very work. So I pray that you would open ears and eyes and hearts, that where there may be callousness, that it would be softened. That where there is maybe a hardness or arrogance of heart, that it would be tenderized and humble because of Christ. I pray where circumstances are difficult and voices of the world and questions and fear and anger may be rising, I pray that they be quieted in front of your word because of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that most of all you be magnified through your word in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, our passage, and really all of what Paul has been addressing in this church's divisions is is how the Christian is to regard themselves. It can be maybe not clear at first. It can be hard to see at first, but this These verses are how a Christian, how one who is Christ is to regard themselves, to view themselves, to to live with themselves. See, the Corinthians have sought to boast in the wisdom of the world and and in men so that they could be associated with, with greatness and ultimately appear great themselves. They wanted to be regarded as wise, regarded as great, regarded as renowned, regarded as worthy and something. The problem is that they have great regard and consideration for the wrong thing. They have great consideration and regard for themselves. Paul's message to them in all of this, the the main point of our message today, the greatest protection against division, the greatest joy in our lives, the thing that we must keep before us is simply this, three words. Here's how you are to regard yourself. You are Christ. You are Christ. These three words represent a reality that is greater than the wildest imagination a believer can have. You are Christ. There is no greater regard. There is no greater designation. There is no better identity. There is no better value or worth or satisfaction than to be Christ's. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing greater than for us to be constantly reminded and live in the reality each and every moment that you are Christ's. He is the wisdom of we are to boast of and pursue and prize. He is the one we are to build our life upon and around and with. He is not just the foundation, but he's also the blueprints and everything in between. He is the one we are to regard above all things, and because we are him, we are to regard ourselves as Christ's. So before we dive deeper into this passage, let me tell you who needs these words. There are some very specific people that need these words. Anyone here this morning who Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior this morning and you hear these words, you need this to be Christ. You are invited to listen to what Jesus has done and respond to him. 
Here's who else this is for. This is for any who have grown comfortable in the rhythms and routines of life and don't necessarily feel very close to Jesus. You are his, but it's more about just being faithful and doing the right things. And it's hard to remember the last time you encountered God. It's for the proud and arrogant and unteachable one. It's for the one who wants to make a name for themselves and prove themselves to others. It's, it's for the anxious and weary. It's for the self-focused and insecure. It's for the everyday normal Christian who needs to be freshly reminded of who you are. The best thing about you this morning isn't anything about you, Christian. It's that you are Christ's. So as we dive deeper into this point, all it's going to revolve around are those three words, this wonderful reality, you are Christ's. And as we dive deeper, let's turn our attention to verses 16 and 17 and see the reality of verses 16 and 17 is this. Using this building imagery, you are no, we are no ordinary structure. This is not an ordinary building. We are not an ordinary structure. There is significance of being Christ's church. See, Paul picks up this continued imagery that he's been building upon. Specifically, that this is not just some ordinary structure that serves the workmen who build it. He's not just saying, well, if you build it, he will come. He's not just saying, if you build it, what will be, what will be. He's focusing in here very specifically, what are we building as Christians? What are we being built into by Christ himself? Is not just a structure with our best attempt. It is being built into a holy temple of God. In these two verses, Paul is helping the church to see its nature and its significance in its local setting, as well as to issue a very strong and unsettling warning against any who would destroy the temple of God through division. Do you not know a rebuke in form of a question? One, oh, I heard a lot as a child. Do you not know? Why have you not remembered? Paul scolds the Corinthians here for not knowing their status and their place in relation to God. Do you not know? You've forgotten what to regard. What Paul is saying here is something that, that should have been realized when they were saved and the Holy Spirit dwelled with them. What he's about to say here is inherent knowledge for a Christian. See, this imagery reflects the Old Testament people of God, but brings its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. In the Old Testament, the temple is where God chose to tabernacle with his people. It was a specific location with a specific design and measurements and everything laid out in detail. What Paul is communicating here is that the church is the corporate dwelling place of God. When we are gathered together in Jesus' name, we experience the presence and power of Christ in our midst. And as it's already been mentioned by Paul, the Spirit is what marks Christ's people, his holy temple. God's holy, Spirit-empowered people, by definition and design, is meant to be set apart from the world which clues us into the kind of structure, the kind of people that we are to be and the kind of building we are to do. See, being set apart doesn't mean being cut off altogether. It doesn't mean we go live in a convent or a utopian society and shut the world out. In a very real sense, because I know we have some people here who like alternative, right? The alternative style, the alternative edge, the alternative music. You, you like to be different. You like to be set apart. Well, guess what? You are not the OG to you alternative speaking people. You are not the OG alternative. Christ is. 
God's people are the original alternative and right community. The church in Corinth was meant to be set apart, holy, spirit-empowered, looking nothing like the world. But through their strife and their jealousy, through their pursuit of worldly wisdom and boasting in men, you could not see a difference between the world and Christ's holy temple. By their conduct, they were desecrating the temple of God and grieving the spirit. And this is the reality for anyone who destroys the temple of God. It's destruction. The threat of destruction is real. That's the seriousness at the bottom line of a heart that says, I'm against a brother or a sister. Of one that says, I am not working through my heart towards them until they work towards me. This is you. You are a destroyer of the holy temple of God. But what's incredible in this is that this threat of destruction is both real and at the same time, an invitation for the church to become what they, in fact, are already by the grace of God. Christ's body, the local church, his holy temple is to be set apart for his purposes. We are to be set apart for his purposes and empowered by his spirit for his glory and his name which is what makes what the Corinthian church has been doing so grieving in the eyes of Paul and the Lord. It is what makes it so grieving and such a, a, a strong warning for any Christian who would regard themselves over Christ. So let me tell you this. If you find yourself wrestling with or given to jealousy or strife or blessing or, or thinking that you're wise in any shape or form this morning, these words, this warning, tell you simply, repent. Repent. Repent and respond to this gracious invitation of the reality of your life. Heed this warning that destruction will be yours if you do not cease in these ways. And as you do that, you cast your eyes upon the one whom you are. Christ, for he is gracious and ready to forgive, and his spirit is working to transform you and sanctify those fleshly desires into Christ-like ones. Much has been said over the last number of weeks in terms of practical application for these verses from chapter 110 until this morning about being the people of God and building your life upon Christ's. So I'm not going to dive back into what's already been said. I trust you have been listening and considering and applying that to your own life. But here's what I want to say this morning. The emphasis of these two verses is a vision-casting principle that has broad and specific application. If there is no application, then you have, you, this has fallen on deaf ears and you need Jesus. And the good news is that he is here this morning with words and with love for you. Practical application for this broad principle is daily remembering that our local church, Grace Church, and every local church is no ordinary gathering of people. God himself dwells with us and we are called to be holy and set apart for the Lord and, and upon his promises and his, for his purposes. This is an invitation and call to holy living here on earth. Corporately, this means we are not to build his church with programs and devices and people who are not his. We're not here to entertain people. We don't exist to distract them from the problems. We're not here to help somebody feel a little bit better so they can go back out in the world and drain the battery before coming back and recharging again. We're here to know God and make him known. 
That's corporately. That's us as a body of Christ. And then personally and individually, this means we are to put on Christ at every turn and put to death the things of our flesh. We are to die to arrogant pride. We are to die to anything that smells like self-centered living. We are to forsake jealousy and self-conceited wisdom. We are to forsake boasting in ourselves as if we have anything to boast in. We are to live in, to Christ in humility, others-focused encouragement and serving, celebrating the work of God in others, not being found in competition or comparison. We are to be pursuing the wisdom of God's word and his people and boasting only in the Lord himself. We need to be captured by the vision, this vision of being a holy set apart, spirit-filled, spirit-empowered people for Christ. Church, I'm not trying to convince you of this. I'm simply trying to inform you of the reality that already is. If you find yourself ambivalent, if you find yourself unaffected and unmoved, then I urge you to pray and ask the Spirit to, to affect your heart and your mind this moment. Do not go another moment, Christian, where you are not fully affected by the power of Christ, where you are not reminded of the riches of Christ. When you're tempted to think, ho-hum, woe is me, despairing or lethargic thoughts of your life, remember that your life is not ordinary. And it's not ordinary because you are extraordinary. It's not ordinary because, say it's not ordinary, and it is extraordinary, but it's not because of you. It's because you are Christ's. Your flesh is going to want to work in such a way that you will doubt this reality and then spend your time arguing and convincing yourself and doubting the reality that you are Christ's. That's how the flesh works. You don't just say, well, I'm not going to believe I'm not Christ. You're going to think, I'm not worthy of Christ. I've sinned too much so Christ can't love me. I've done too much. I've, I've, I've not said things when I should have. I've not stood up for truth when I should have. And a matter of fact, I've only encouraged it. I failed time and again. I'm gonna, you're going to be filled with doubt and anxiety and very easily see all of your sin, tem, tem, sins, temptations, and faults. Brothers and sisters, the matter is settled. The matter is settled. I don't know how to tell you how that, that is good news. The matter is settled. The conversation is over. You are Christ's forgiven, cleansed, not condemned justified, adopted, co-heirs with Christ. It is in Christ that your life has significance and without him and the things of him, there is not just no significance, you are a, mar a life marked for destruction and judgment and the wrath of God. But in Christ, all things are yours. And so here is the application. So there are broad principles that we pursue, but here is one specific application to you are Christ's. Live like it. You are Christ's. Live like it. Do not doubt. Do not fear. Do not fight. Pursue holiness and godliness. Rely on the Spirit and live by His power. Grow in greater relationship with God and each other for the glory of God. You are Christ's brother and sister. You live like it. You are no ordinary structure. You are not just some mundane person who's living out his days, trying to do the best they can of what they've been given. You are Christ. 
Your meaning, your value, your purpose, your significance in life is Christ and Christ alone. This is not some message to to hopefully encourage you and excite you about living your best life now in Christ. This is about Christ alone. You are Christ's. The matter is settled. The conversation is over. Live like it. I don't know about you, but the reason I get to simple statements is because I can remember simple statements like, you are Christ's. Live like it. A six-year-old can understand that. And a hundred-year-old can understand that. And yet the reality is in Christ, both experience the riches of grace in Christ when you recall that you are Christ's. I'm trying not to preach where I'm trying to get to because I have work to cover, but I'm failing badly. Remember those commercials where it was a direct TV? I don't know if you all have watched TV much or commercials, but there was direct TV commercials where it was like, don't be like Mike. And Mike was like, you know, he didn't do this thing, which then he didn't do this thing. It was like he didn't get a glass of milk, which then caused him to hunger, which then he did list his job. And then he's homeless and destitute. And if Mike had just gotten direct TV, everything would have been fine. It was just, they were ludicrous commercials. It was like, don't be like Mike. Church, don't be like the Corinthian church. Be like Christ. Recognize that the temptation to destroy the holy temple of God that is you and us is within you, and then in joyful amazement, live for Christ. See, but Paul is not yet done correcting their wrong thinking, and so he brings up again what divides us from Christ and each other in verses 18 through 21a. Have you ever wondered why some theologians or scholars say A and B in a verse? It's because there's a thought that stops. So verse 18 to 21a is what divides us from Christ and each other. Let me read that again. Let no one deceive himself. If, any among, if anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. You would, you, you can, I'm sorry, I sat down. You all can see me fine, right? I just want to make sure I'm not hiding behind the podium. You would think that Paul would immediately bring a conclusion to this foundation and, and building conversation that, that he's been having because that's what I would want him to do. No ordinary structure, a holy temple, a warning, and then just blow me away, Paul, with the riches of Christ. But instead, he continues to warn the church. He says, so he already said to them, do you not know? And he says, now let no one deceive himself. Again, this is a deceived, badly placed, regarded people. These verses have been covered, oh, at length and in detail, so I'm not going to spend much time going back into them. But here Paul is hitting at the very heart of the problem. Let no one deceive himself. The problem is self-deception. The Corinthians are self-deceived in their thinking and in their living. They are self-deceived in what they value and prize. They are are self-deceived in their very identity and worth. They think they are wise. They think they've arrived in knowledge and in spiritual maturity, which is exactly their problem. To quote David Garland, those who are wise in their own eyes have not yet come to terms with the fact that they still have to reckon with God, who makes human wisdom look foolish. Paul assumes that human judgments are inherently skewed until they are set aright by God's spirit. Consequently, humans must empty themselves of their own wisdom to be filled with God's wisdom. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. In ultimate truth and reality, consider the cross, the wisdom of God, the power of God for salvation in the eyes of the world. It's a despicable, terrible death that only the worst of humanity deserves to do. 
but the wisdom of God is a cross of salvation. In the wisdom of God, wisdom is folly, and folly is wisdom. Weakness is power. Leaders are servants. God's people are nothing, yet possess all things. The implication and application, church, of this is that God's people are to abandon confidence in anything other than Jesus. Abandon confidence in your ability or strengths or reason or intellect or prowess or skill. We must have confidence to trust in God's folly of salvation by faith alone. And when you do this, you will become a fool to the world. A fool. Another word that's used here, quite literally, a moron. A fool and moron to the world. There are so many ways that that this looks like, but consider the worldly ways. Hmm. When it comes to being a fool for Jesus, we need to be careful here. It doesn't mean that we just start acting foolish to draw attention to ourselves. It's a living for Christ that will draw attention to us but not to us, to Christ, and yet we will look like fools. And here's the, here's the foolishness of God or the wisdom of God in light of the world. The world says, get even with your enemies. Jesus says, love them. The world says, keep what's yours. Work hard for it. Get it. Protect it. Defend it. It's your rights and your freedoms. And Jesus says, give freely. Living as Christ means that you will look like a fool to the world. You will look like a moron who's better off being put in a home than being listened to or lived around. See, to bring home this point, Paul cites two passages in Scripture here in these verses. He quotes Job 5.13, which pictures a hunter stalking prey and capturing it. And his point in citing this scripture here is that God catches the crafty in their own craftiness. The wise are too clever for their own eternal good and always get tripped up and caught And caught in a trap is not some metaphor for maybe just occasionally there, but as a metaphor for dead in the trap. And the second quote is from Psalm 94, verse 11, which communicates that the Lord knows our thoughts, and what are our thoughts? They are futile. Futile. (laughs) Oh, I think I've had two thoughts in my life where I thought that was really good. One was when I asked Kelly to marry me. And the other was responding, and this is not in order, so you don't think this. The other was when I responded to the Lord and thought I need him to be my Lord and Savior. best thoughts I've ever had left to myself, as God says, are futile. Because it is only by the grace of God that he saved me, and it is only by the grace of God that Kelly said yes. The clever and wise thoughts of man are known by God, and he considers them all futile. So then why would you boast in anything? Why? To me, this is practical reason why you don't get on an airplane. I'm not confident in the ability of an engineer and a mechanic. I'm confident in Andy O'Brien, but he is never my pilot. You see, the great danger that divides us from Christ the great destroyer of a holy temple 
the essence of self-deception is pride. Think over Paul's words for just a moment and what they mean. Let no one deceive himself. The wise will be caught in their own traps. The best thoughts of the wise are nothing but futile attempts. And here they are boasting and prizing in the very things that God says essentially are death. The great and collective wisdom of humanity is foolish and futile. In wisdom, humanity has launched into space and onto another moon and come back. In wisdom, disease and sickness can be cured with with medicine. In wisdom, technological advancement has helped those missing limbs function as if they had them. In wisdom, there are architectural wonders. And wisdom is still growing and approving and accomplishing good things in this world. And yet... Man's wisdom is futile and the very thing and the only thing that matters most. The wisdom of man cannot save you. The greatest wisdom and minds in the world cannot save a soul. A right perspective, a godly and biblical perspective of wisdom in this world is seen as God's common grace to humanity who doesn't deserve it. That's what it is, God's common grace. Not as humanity's brilliance and glory and amazement. When the Olympics come around every two years or whatever they're going to do now because of COVID, It's always a display of the human body and skill and ability. If we're not careful, we would become like the Corinthians and prize and idolize and adore and want to be like them, when yet we should see through Scripture's eyes that these are God's creatures, functioning as he has created them to his glory and for his purposes, and yet for the most have rejected him and declare, I am me, I am mine. For all the good that it accomplishes in our world, and there is good that wisdom has accomplished in our world, which is by God's common grace. In the grand eternal spiritual picture, it is nothing but a complete and absolute waste. That's why we don't boast in the wisdom of the world, it's rubbish. And when we do boast in our great thinking and wisdom, it's because we are simply self deceived in our pride. So here, let me give you a litmus test for evaluating your self-deception. Because church, it's not a matter of if you are tempted to be self-deceived, it is a matter of where and how. How teachable are you? How teachable are you? And then secondarily, How often do you pursue the wisdom of God in his word and in his people in this local church? How teachable are you? And how often do you pursue his wisdom in the word and the people of this church? You see, an unteachable person is one who thinks he knows everything. One of those, there's a a million of them, those teacher sayings of those proverbs, if you will. But a teacher once said, I would have excellent scholars if they had not been so fully persuaded of their own scholarship. Are you teachable and humble because you are fully convinced of your own self-deception? And how about pursuing the wisdom of God's word and the counsel of his people? Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. It's important for self-deceived people to not lean on their own understanding, even if they think they have wisdom and especially if they think they have wisdom. So who do you lean on for understanding and wisdom? Yourself, maybe a coworker who's not a Christian or whose maturity is not one that you should be looking to. Maybe it's some, some social media entity. Or is it God's word exclusively and those sitting around you in this church this morning You see, Christ is both the foundation 
of your life cannot be broken, will never fade away, is strong, sure, and certain. But he's also the foundation of your life. You cannot build a house, a structure on the foundation of God with man-made materials. It is by Christ himself. An unteachable and self-deceived person seeks to write their own blueprints and declare them great as only a fool or moron would do. It would be like saying, it would be like a PE teacher walking in to Johns Hopkins University, a cancer center in our country, and saying, I have a teaching degree. I'm going to teach you all how to do brain surgery in the next three minutes. How great am I? How good am I? How impressive am I? You would be laughed, not only out of the room, but probably, probably restrained and thrown in the psych ward. And that's a funny imagery, but that's what we do with our lives when we tell Christ who we are. When we seek to live for ourselves and we have our own designs and ambitions and own plans and we say, look at the life I have constructed, God. Yes, you put me here. Yes, I was dead, literally, spiritually, but now I'm alive. Yes, you've done all things. You caused me to breathe. You caused me to think. But look what I have done of my own accord with my own power and my own ability. Be impressed of what I've done for you. That's not quite as funny, is it? But yet it's, that one gets a lot closer to home. By the grace of God, all things are ours because we are Christ's. And so let me ask you, how teachable are you? Are you unteachable? Are you unwilling to listen to somebody unless they themselves are impressive? Now, I'm not saying you go ask, that you go seek wisdom from someone who has none or maybe needs to grow in some. But you don't have to worry about that in God's word and from mature people of the Lord. See, there is a kind of person that's being addressed here. This self-deceived person. There, there is in this picture, if we take the, the sum total of all of these words from chapter 1, verse 10 to here and now and, and the rest of 1 Corinthians, there is a person that is coming into picture here, a, a person that has two, what we might say, extremes, but really is one and the same person. In this picture, we see a person who is cocky and self-sufficient, as well as one who is filled with fearful insecurity. It's not two different people. It's not two different types, but it's one and the same. See, cocky, self-sufficient people who boast in their wisdom and greatness have deceived themselves by denying their deeply rooted insecurity. Every person has a built-in sense of insecurity and vulnerability. And don't worry, I'm not going to get therapeutic much more than this. But we understand insecurity and we understand vulnerability. It comes with our sin. It can be a driving and crippling force in our lives. Afraid of everything. Anxiety and depression. Consider every possible worst outcome. Every new thing that comes their way is a mountain of impossibility. Change Oh, the category of change is the worst nightmare for someone who wrestles with fearfulness and insecurity. Change is also the worst, the worst enemy for somebody who's cocky and self-sufficient. The self-sufficient, self-deceived person, this cocky, arrogant one, is one who's attempting to show that we have everything under control. I am the master of my fate. I have it all together, or I know someone who does, and I'm going to be like them. Fearful insecurity, arrogant pride, both rooted in human pride. One says, I can handle my pro own problems, and the other is that nobody can handle my problems. I can handle my problems, and no one can handle my problems. This Self-deceiving pride is a direct attack upon Christ. One, 
is to feel no need for Christ because it says, I don't need Jesus to save or help me. And the other is to feel that your need is so great that Christ can help you. It says he is unable to save or help you. One looks strong, one looks weak. Both are lies about the reality of who you are and who Christ is. To the self-sufficient, your wisdom is folly and futile. To the cocky and arrogant one, everything about you is rubbish. Give it up. Become a fool for Christ, for Christ is greater than you or anything else you will find on this earth. You don't even enter the picture in the grandeur and glory of God. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. If you long to know true greatness, then know Christ and the path to him is humility. And to the fearful and insecure one, to the fearful and insecure one, your problems, your future, your circumstances, your sin, listen carefully, are no match for Christ. There is nothing in life that is a match for Christ. And to truly address the self-sufficient, fearful one, to truly cut at the heart of self-deception and show how the wisdom of God is true wisdom, Paul gives us the remaining words to show us what you have in Christ alone. In In verse 21, just read along with me again. What you have in Christ, for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. Notice first that Paul doesn't tell them what they must do and who they must become in order to be better Christians. He tells them to be fools, but he doesn't say much more than that. Instead, he reminds them of what they already have and who they already are. And what we have because of Christ is all things. Now, at first reading of this, you might think, well, that, what does that really mean? He can't really mean all things, can, can he? Oh, oh, he does, church. There is not a mistaken word or phrase here. If God had meant to say he gives us some things or not all things or a few things or a majority of things, trust, it would have said that very thing. It is no mistake, Christian, this morning that Christ, that God says in Christ, all are yours. Which now presents us with an unfathomable problem in front of us. A problem that is wonderfully deep to jump off the edge of this clip and free fall into as Christians. All things are yours. And to drive this point home, He picks up the language he's been using. The divisions over whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, he says, you've been thinking about this all wrong. You've been fighting over table scraps. You've been saying in your local church where you've had Paul and Apollos, and you've had people come from Peter, Cephas, you're willing to say, well, I want to divide. I want this guy or that guy. He's saying, no, you've set the bar far too low. They are all yours. All of them are yours. The church doesn't belong to apostles or teachers. They are ministers of the church. They are servants of the church. And this church was claiming far too little and dividing over their favorite teacher or their favorite style. The church possesses these men. The church possesses their pastors and their preachers because they are Christ's. Leaders in the church are servants. That's the wisdom of God. It would be like deciding, it would be like everyone deciding who their favorite pastor is based on your preaching or counseling or time with them or you fill in the blank and then deciding that one is best so I'm going to be like that one. Paul is saying if that's what you're going to do, you're aiming far too low because they are all yours because they're all mine. And because they are mine, they are yours. 
This isn't license for you to seek your teaching from podcasts or sermons from pastors of other churches, though in the universal church, they are yours too. This is direction that all of your local pastors are your pastors who exist to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to you and not just one in particular. So do not restrict yourself to only one. All are yours. And not just your pastors. What else does it say? It says also, but the world. The world here doesn't mean the, the evil system that the Bible talks about as if the world, the, the sin and the imagery of it all. Paul is referring literally to the physical created universe. It doesn't belong to countries that have like fought over boundaries and exchanged territories. It doesn't belong to conquerors. It belongs to the one who created it all and the one who created it all says, it's yours. The Bible says the, earth, the, the inheritance of the earth is for the meek and mild believer. Everything in this universe is yours in Christ for the express purpose of enjoying God and glorifying him through it all. Whatever God has made is mine. And not just now presently, but eternally in the new heavens and the earth. It's yours. This doesn't mean that you leave here today and you can say, well, that's my car even though it belongs to so-and-so, but you said it's the physical created earth, so I can just take it. That's a foolish and funny answer. I'm not going to get into the semantics of this. This also doesn't mean that, well, recreational drugs rub the earth, and you said it's mine, so I can therefore partake whatever I want. That is not wisdom as well. You are to enjoy God's creation for his glory. It is yours so that you may know God better. And not just, not just the world, but also look what he says. Life is yours. Eternal, true life is yours in Christ. Ephesians 2 reminds us that we were all dead in our sins, but Christ has made us alive. In Christ, life is yours. The eternal life of knowing God is ours. The eternal reality of you are Christ's. Look at the next one. It says, death is ours. I don't know how many people would immediately say, yes, death is mine. I was hoping that was going to be on this list. I love that category. I get excited talking about death and thinking about it. The problem with death is that we often look at it as a master that destroys and brings pain. Do you know what death is to a Christian? Nothing more than a servant that carries a Christian to where they ultimately need to be. In Christ, death has been conquered and defeated and is a servant of Christ. And in this true understanding, death to a Christian is not a matter of mourning, but rejoicing because Christ has triumphed over death. And not just death, but the present. The present is ours. That's quite literally everything in our present reality. Everything. We want it to mean just all the good things. All of the objects, all of the people, all of the situations, all of the circumstances, all of the events, all of the trials, all of the blessings, all things in the present are ours. One author said of the present being ours in Christ like this. It's as if all in life are a multitude of servants surrounding us on bended knees. They hold out their offerings to us. Some of these servants like pain or injury or sickness or grief may first have a strange look to us. However, it is God who commissions them all and makes each one bring us some blessing so that we shall lack nothing. Pain, grief, and sorrow serves you. It's yours. We know that in everything in our present is ours and is from God for our good and for his glory. Romans verse 8. And we know that nothing can separate us from our love when we're tempted to doubt that in the midst of pain and difficulty but all of the present is yours. And then lastly, Paul tells us that the future is yours too. Well, what is that? Honestly, I have no idea because guess what? It's in the future. We don't know what the future is going to hold. We know the ultimate future is that God will return and we will be with him. 
But I can tell you this, based on what Paul is saying here, no matter what, listen to, listen to you fearful people who worry about the future and wonder about many things and spend time being sinfully anxious and having great consternation in your soul about your future. Whatever the future holds, it will be amazing. Not some empty promise, not some man-made slogan or motto, but the word of Christ. All are yours. And consider this. So if, if all of these pastors, if world, life, death, present, future, if all things are yours, where is division to be found? Because they're all ours equally. So if everything belongs to every Christian, then division is to be found nowhere because in Christ we are one and not segmented. So the, to the cocky, self-sufficient one and the fearful, insecure one, how are you doing now? How are you doing, oh, self-deceived one? I should think that there is a mixture of embarrassment for pursuing such a paltry and pitiful amount of things for yourself that you think you've carved out that are special and unique just for you. And hopefully an overwhelming love of Christ in its place. To the proud and boastful, there is nothing that you have not received that wasn't given to you. And even if you were to boast in comparison to Christ, you have nothing to say. And to the insecure one, you have nothing to fear in Christ, for he is far better and greater than your problems, and all things are yours. In him you lack nothing, and you need not worry about anything. Because as he says here, all are yours. If I was a member of the Corinthian church, at this point right here, up to verse 22, I would feel a bit of embarrassment, probably a bit of confusion, hopefully a lot of conviction, and hopefully a lot of anticipation and hope and excitement because now all things are mine. Because I could take that as they're mine. The emphasis is mine. They're mine. So let me... Oh, let me be healthy, wealthy, and wise, because they're mine. But that's why Paul is one of the best teachers in the world. That's why God's word is what it is. Because lest we be confused, there is clarity. You who are deceived, you who have forgotten what you inherently know as a Christian, you who would follow after other things, you proud and arrogant, fearful and insecure one who wants to make a name for himself. Yes, all things are yours, but you need to understand whose you are, which is far better than all things are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God. Listen to that, my brothers and sisters. Let that just settle down upon you. Let it, let it wash over you. Let it trickle. Let it, let it just spread. You are Christ's. Yes, all things are yours because... You are Christ. You are Christ. Yes, sin and temptation still exist in our lives, and if we're not dependent on the Spirit, not pursuing humility, not pursuing Christ, then we will be found working against God. But if you are Christ, then His then this is the last word on your salvation, on your place, on how you regard yourself today. You are Christ. And as Christ's, 
is no ordinary life. So is yours. You have the righteousness of Christ. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, God himself. You have been set apart for the purposes of God. Your life is actually not your life any longer. It's Christ's. As I've been thinking about this message and, and this truth and this reality, and what's the one, the one, if we hear nothing else, the one great application to you are Christ. I told you, yes, live like it, practically. But there has been this phrase, and I, I couldn't remember where I heard it from until last night when I asked Kelly. And as this world, this, this year has just been a year, and it first started normal, and then it felt like it's been 10 years, and now it feels like we're speeding along and it's going to be Christmas before we know it. Charles Dickens' voice came to my head. The ghost, if you're familiar with that story, A, a Christmas Carol, in it, Scrooge is someone who needs to be saved imagery for it, and he's visited by three ghosts to help him see his past, his present, and the potential future. And a miraculous work is done in the end. But in the middle, the ghost of Christmas present says to Scrooge a line that I believe is how we are to apply and walk away from this reality, you are Christ. He says to Scrooge from the other room as he enters the room, he says, come in and know me better, man. Come in and know me better, man. I can hear this very phrase issuing from Paul's words this morning in this text. I can hear these words from the Lord himself as he sits upon his throne. I see it demonstrated by God himself at every page of the Bible. Come in and know me better, man. The answer to division and jealousy and pride and broken relationships isn't some 10-step plan to live better for Jesus. The key to having all things in life work for your good isn't accomplished through wisdom. It's through knowing whose you are and seeking to know him. God delights to reveal more of himself to us. So let us seek to know God more intimately and personally and corporately together. Let's, let's not simply seek to know more about God. Let's not just seek to learn information about him, knowledge that would puff us up, but to truly know him. What can you do this day? What can you do each and every day, this, this week, to know God better? A sign of someone who truly knows their God is increasing delight and devotion to his word. Maybe it's reading and meditating and memorizing on the Bible more consistently. Maybe it's reading other books that will help you to know who he is, whether it's a, a systematic theology or a biblical theology or just a simple book like Jaya Packer's Knowing God. Another sign of someone who truly knows God is incessantly in prayer. And they don't pray just asking for God to do things. They pray in thanksgiving. They pray in rejoicing. They pray for God to reveal more of himself. They pray his will to be revealed. They pray to be all of his. Listen, there are many ways we could walk the pursuit of seeking God, but there is one specific way in coming in to know God and know him better that I believe God would have us consider. We all have full lives. Everyone has many responsibilities and cares and work in front of them. Life never seems to have enough time to get through everything you have to, much less anything you really want to. When we consider that we are Christ's, I think the greatest application for us is to simply spend time with Jesus. Man, I'm going to invite you to come. To spend time alone with Jesus where the purpose is to be free of distraction, where the only agenda is to know him better. Maybe there's worship music playing. Maybe you're on a walk or sitting quietly in a room. Maybe you're pacing the carpet like I do. But the purpose is to be undistractedly Christ's. Maybe you are reading and praying a specific scripture or you're simply declaring how great he is or you're reminding yourself of who you are in him or of all the things you have in him or of all that he's been faithful to you in or dreaming of heaven and what that will be like or maybe you do all of that together. 
What a time it is to spend with the one whose you are. You are his beloved. Whatever the state of your heart and affections towards Christ today, they are not, listen to this carefully, whatever the state of affections and heart towards Christ, they are not adequate of him. And yet God delights as a father to his children to give more of himself to you, to know him. I can't tell you how many times, <laughs> how many times in my day I recount that I am Christ's. This morning alone as I wake up, very aware of the thorn in my flesh and yet purposing it's not about me it's about Christ as I drive to church Christ may it be about you and all I do for I know the temptation is to make it about me when I go home afterwards and think I'm ready to rest I've earned rest I need rest I'm in pain, I, I'm tired, I, I need, I have, I want. I am Christ. I have all I need. I lack nothing. And God's grace is more than sufficient for me. When I'm tempted to think that God loves me, and yet predominantly I think of his love as a past action that still kind of runs on, I need to remind myself that the love of Christ is just as active and present and working and felt and encountered today as it was that day hundreds of years ago at the cross and as it was a millennium ago in the creation of the world and as it will be in eternity before God. So many times... I just have to close my eyes to shut out the world. So all I want is Jesus. Church, there's no better news to a person than to be reminded that you are Christ's and from there to be reminded by God himself that you are to regard yourself as his. So let us remember and regard ourselves this way. You are Christ's. So come and know him better. Spirit of God, I pray that this would be the reality. I pray that we would know you better and live in the reality that we are yours and not our own. I pray that you would bring fresh encouragement and grace, fresh conviction and excitement for living for you. I pray that there would be equal parts of amazement that we just can't physically move beyond because we can't understand the reality of this and it's too good for us to fathom. And I pray we'd be filled with a holy energy of living for you in all we do. Thank you that we are yours, Lord. Remind us of this regularly, please, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name.